Welcome to Copy Time, a podcast series on markets and economies from DBS Group Research. I'm Tamur Beg, Chief Economist, welcoming you to our 90th episode. Wow, I can't believe that. Uh, today, we will talk about Ukraine and also a bit about Russia. Our guest is Dr. Torbjörn Becker, Director of the Stockholm Institute of Transition e- Economics, site at the Stockholm School of Economics in Sweden, a position that Tor- Torbjörn has occupied since 2006. Site is a leading research and policy center on economic development in low- and middle-income countries, with an emphasis on transition in the former Soviet Union and Central and Eastern Europe. Torbjörn is also a board member of several economics research institutes in Eastern Europe, including the Kiev School of Economics. Prior to this, he worked for nine years at the International Monetary Fund, where his work focused on international macro, economic crises, and issues related to the international financial system. Corbin Becker, welcome to Kobe Time. Thank you. Thank you. Great to be here. Great to have you. Uh, let's talk about some of the context associated with Ukraine, uh, Torbjörn, if you will. Uh, help us get a size, sense of the size and relevance of the economy, uh, and you can take as much time as you want in terms of setting that context. All right. Yeah, I mean, the, the first thing to note, of course, is that Ukraine is a very big country with a lot of people living there. Uh, but in terms of economic size, GDP, it's really not such a great economy uh, if if we measure it uh, in contrast to countries in the European Union. So before the war, it was less than 200 billion US dollars worth of GDP for one year. Um, and, you know, a country like I'm in, Sweden, actually has a bigger GDP uh, with only 10 million people compared to 40 million people in Ukraine. Yeah, and um, if we think probably it, the country yeah. that I'm in has 5 million people that has a bigger GDP. Exactly. So, you know, in, in some sense, this is, is actually good news where we are now, because we're discussing, of course, how can we assist Ukraine? So, so given this, you know, we can easily handle you know, the economic cost of Ukraine. And, and I think this is something that we really uh, need to remember now when we're discussing different support packages to Ukraine. So compared to our economies, the Ukrainian economy is relatively small. And what about the performance uh, over the last 10, 15 years? Because this is not the only conflict Ukraine has uh, dealt with, and there has been some political instability. So has the economic performance also suffered in recent years and decades? Well, I mean, as we all know, it has been ups and downs, and you have the the Crimea invasion already in 2014, and we have had political turmoil at, at different time periods, and you also had external shocks uh, over the history of, of Ukraine since independence in back in the early 90s. So it has been a, a quite a, a challenging uh, economic road. And, and a lot of people compare, of course, Ukraine to Poland, for example, they were at similar levels when transition started, and now Poland is, of course, well ahead of, of Ukraine in terms of economic developments. But I, I would say, you know, it has underperformed similar countries in the region uh, over over the last couple of decades. But also, when when there are no external shocks, when they're no not subject to external aggressions. They actually, Ukraine has shown sort of good growth rates and progress in different reform areas. But it it has been a very complicated time uh, quite often over the last couple of decades. Well, that's an interesting insight that there has been, you know, stability dividend, if you will, the moment there have been interludes of peace. Uh, What about the economic structure of Ukraine? If I'm not mistaken, and this is knowledge from two decades ago, is that under the Soviet Union, there were certain countries that were sort of earmarked for, or certain you know parts of the Soviet Union Republic that were earmarked for technology and industry, and Ukraine was one of those. So even after the break of the Soviet Union, it was one of the more industrialized part of former Soviet Union. Yes, absolutely. So we all know about sort of the steel production, and, and we saw the horrible pictures from Azovstal, which was, of course, producing a lot of metals. We also know that Ukraine has some of the most fertile soils, uh, basically from all over the world, and produces a lot of grain and food that that can be exported to other countries. But it's also now more recently 
uh, becoming a, a really an IT and tech hub. So a lot of programmers and developers are down there. Foreign companies also go there to find developers. Uh, and then, as, as we also know, they they were producing some uh, high quality sort of industrial products during the Soviet times, including things that went into military production. And the export sector beyond agriculture, I mean, uh, I guess, you know, there is a, the, the steel component, but uh, do we see anything beyond that, like electronics or so on coming from Ukraine to the rest of the world? Yeah, I, I would say, you know, the the quite significant thing uh, over the last couple of years is the IT sector. Okay. Uh, so basically having developers in Ukraine uh, doing things that, that people from around the world is demanding. That's a, uh, an interesting sector to look at. So the services part has been sort of more dynamic part than the manufacturing side. Yeah, I would say so, yes. Okay. So, uh, Torbjörn, your institute has been tracking the economic damage inflicted by this conflict. And uh, I think it is important for us, you know, just to go beyond the newspaper headlines that we see on a regular basis and to get some in-depth uh, assessment from you from how deep the economic damage has been so far and what's the outlook going forward. Yeah, so there are many dimensions to this, of course. Uh, one thing that the Kiev School of Economics is keeping track of is, is just uh, the damage to infrastructure. So residential housing, airports, roads, bridges, etc. Um, and, you know, that count is already over 130 billion US dollars in damages to that infrastructure. And again, remember that GDP was less than 200 billion US dollars before the war started. So, you know, that's a very significant amount. But that's also sort of a very low uh, benchmark for the damages. The World Bank in its estimates, where they have a bigger picture on, on other types of losses, they they talk about 350 billion US dollars. Uh, and then the Ukrainian government itself, when you start to include losses of income, losses of exports, losses of investment, they talk about 750 billion US dollars. So, you know, these estimates really depend on where do we draw the limits on what we want to include in them. So it goes from, you know, basic infrastructure things, 130 billion to have the whole economy and suffering and all of that, that goes to 750 billion. So um, a quite, uh, quite massive cost of, of this war already for Ukraine. And These, yeah, I mean, if you just look also maybe in terms of flows, if we just look at GDP numbers for this year, people are talking about a decline of 35% of, of GDP uh, in 2022 for U Ukraine. These numbers are so large, uh, probably it's, it's very hard to sort of, you know, fathom it. Um, in terms of macro, I mean, I'm sure, you know, measurement is becoming very, very difficult. It's not just in the con context of GDP, but any sense of, you know, inflation and jobs and, and overall activity, how things are? Yeah, I mean, we have we have seen inflation going up, of course. And, and also a lot of industries have been destroyed and, and people have lost their jobs. At the same time, of course, a lot of people from Ukraine have left the country because it was not possible to stay there, uh, given what, what Russia is, is sending their way. So, uh, you, you have this both supply and demand effect on the labor market, but certainly if we think about employment, that's that's really taken a big hit in the war. And sort of real income, so people that stay in Ukraine have been coming down. So a very challenging environment for sure. Any sense of, you know, this, this you know, months and now heading into a year worth of conflict, is it causing an erosion of human capital? I mean, are people able to go to school and colleges? Are degrees being issued uh, or, or have those things come to a standstill? Well, this, of course, varies uh, across the country. Some schools have been completely destroyed and people have left. And, and you know, now with all of the people outside of Ukraine, it's a question of how the recipient countries sort of are dealing with education. And, and that varies to uh, quite significantly between different countries. But if you think about the situation in Ukraine, one of the issues is that 
a lot of the students cannot physically go to their schools because if you do that, you need to provide a bomb shelter for the, mm. the students. Otherwise, you're not allowed to have, you know, offline uh, lectures. So the, the people at the Kiev School of Economics, they have, first of all, made a bomb shelter in their own school, but they're also collecting funds from donors to build bomb shelters at, at schools in, in different parts of the countries to basically make it possible for the students and children to go back to their schools and, and have classes sort of in person and not just online. So otherwise, of course, teaching would be done online. And we know the limitations of that after the COVID pandemic, of course. Right. Uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about the um, migration uh, that you just touched upon. I want to get a sense of, you know, which country is receiving most of them and how that is going. But before that, um, you know, uh, Torbjorn, unfortunately, this is not the first conflict that we have seen um, in, in, the, in the recent memory. So we had in Europe's own backyard the Yugoslavia conflict in the 1990s, which led to, you know, many, many republics being born out of that, but uh, deep damage and scarring out of that. And also from various former Soviet Union countries in recent years, we've seen uh, various acts of aggression and conflict. Um, I'm sure you and your institute have been trying to get lessons or take lessons from those episodes that what kind of scarring do we have uh, in an economy that is hit by conflict and how long does it take to come back? Uh, can you walk us through some perspective on these issues? Yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert on these issues, but I think, you know, the first thing as economists, we, we of course understand that destroying, you know, lives affects human capital. It also destroys the sense of security it then limits, you know, how institutions can develop. It limits what kind of investments that you will get. And of course, it's always associated with, you know, a, a great deal of uncertainty. So all of these factors are, are things that we, we know uh, affect growth negatively. And of course, then in many cases, also many specific details on this, but I think the most significant thing is really what we have been talking about, which is what what happens to human capital, what happens to people's lives, and what happens to uncertainty in institutions. And that's that's something that we have seen uh, across uh, all of these countries, basically. And the the problem, I think, which is also quite sad, is that you know, in many of these countries that you mentioned, you have still these conflicts between people that used to be neighbors and getting on and now not being, uh, you know, getting on so well. So this is a, a very long lasting process, I think, to deal with these issues. That's that's uh, absolutely spot on, uh, Torbjorn. Uh, the, um, let's talk a little bit about the people who have been forced to leave the country. Uh, again, the numbers are large. Uh, give us a sense of the response of the global community, if you will, whether it is in Europe, or US or elsewhere, who is taking on the refugees and what's your sense of you know how they're being dealt with? Well, first of all, we, we all know that sort of the neighbors uh, to Ukraine in Europe have been receiving a lot of people. Uh, you know, Poland really stands out as being a country that, that opened up and, and really welcomed people from Ukraine uh, to provide them a safe space. But also all over Europe, we have seen quite significant uh, flows of, of people coming from Ukraine. Um, and, and we should also remember, of course, that these things are not static. So they may start, they of course come to, you know, the neighbor country first, and then they may travel on. But then also people have returned to Ukraine uh, at quite significant numbers. But now with the recent attacks, we again see people leaving places like Kherson uh, because it's it's not safe to be there. So it's a very dynamic situation. I, I would say that the, the neighboring countries in Europe have really had an, an open arms policy. Uh, what I think is maybe we could do better is to think about what kind of, of education do we provide to the younger people that come to our countries from Ukraine. Like we said, human capital is going to be critical looking forward. But also basic things like what kind of, of income support can we provide them when they come to our countries? Because uh, 
it's not not easy to be a refugee and live on you know very small incomes uh, it can lead to a lot of different problems in 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 these countries and for these people right just to give our listeners some context i just looked up some numbers about close to 20% of ukrainians are right now estimated to have left the country since the conflict began so that's about 7 and a half million people of which about a fifth are registered in poland so of course poland has taken on most of the burden um uh, torbian uh, let's talk about funding uh how is ukraine funding itself presently well you have you have really a different couple of different time perspectives so the first thing to think about is how is the government now funding all of the things it's doing in ukraine because at at this time military expenditure is running at something like 20% of gdp you know so it's more than half of the government's budget probably at this stage at the same time the government needs to pay out pensions and salaries and take care of of people that really need their support so the government is under a lot of strain in the sense that the tax base and income levels have, have fallen by maybe 35% at the same time as as the the cost expenditures have increased tremendously so there was a period when ukraine was uh using too much of the central bank's printing press to finance the government's budget um fortunately now we see more support coming in from the outside uh and we were talking about maybe a need of of something in the neighborhood of 50 billion US dollars over 2023 that they need in support uh we are getting there slowly um i think what is really important is that this needs to be predictable and it's need to be coming at sort of a, a regular regular and predictable intervals so this has been an issue in the past and and you know the eu is making progress but it's it's also not quick enough i would say uh and maybe another dimension just to mention it is of course that ukraine really needs grants at this time it doesn't need to get a lot of more borrowing on the government's balance sheet but but you know the eu is now providing very long term loans very low interest rates but i think you know it it's really just asking for a debt restructuring discussion coming up at at some stage in the future i i want to get into that whole multilateral approach to uh you know addressing a country that is in conflict i think we've done a lot of uh, or have had many cases of you know post conflict reconstruction under the aegis of the united nations and the world bank and ebrd etc but uh, a, an in conflict situation doing debt restructuring or program i think is uh, adds many many more factors of difficulty and sometimes like you said you know i mean loans versus grants these issues uh probably are not focused upon and then they create problem down the road um so you give us a sense of the funding gap both for the immediate term uh and uh, and of course you know as you said earlier that the large uh, infrastructure destruction you know hundreds of billions of dollars worth of needs down the road would it be the european union that would take the lead i mean is that the thinking or we are seeing efforts to make it a little more multilateral with the us and other multilateral organizations becoming a pretty prominent contributor to the reconstruction of ukraine yeah i mean so we we should remember that now in the short run it really is the us that has provided most of the funding and also in terms of grants mm. so in terms of macroeconomic stability i think really the us has taken a lot of responsibility in this process if we then look at the next step uh, rebuilding and and you know creating a, a competitive ukraine that can enter the european union of course the european union needs to take a, a leading role in in that reconstruction process uh, at the same time i think most people outside we saw a precedence of this last year after the us withdrawal from afghanistan that some of the central bank of afghanistan assets were frozen in uh, various you know accounts in federal reserve of new york and bank of england and so on and some of that has already been earmarked for 9/11 victims and so on. Uh, um I I didn't wasn't aware that similar co- conversations were in place but of course yeah it makes sense uh, given what we've seen elsewhere. Um Torbjorn you recently published a paper with a several other uh, 
co-authors. It was in the website of Center for Economic Policy Research, uh, CPR. And uh, you talked about various dimensions of funding. And I, I like the way you broke up the paper. You had it in sections like credibility, consequences, efficiency, and tipping point. Uh, to those who have not read the paper or will not be reading the paper, if you could elaborate a bit. Well, I mean, as you said, there are several dimensions of, of doing something like this. So first of all, we, we need to get significant funding uh, lined up. That's the obvious first step uh, to avoid, you know, having macroeconomic difficulties. The second part of it is really about how do we organize things? What is the governance structure around this? How do we make sure that the Ukrainian government uh, has sort of the ownership of how it wants to rebuild its its country and at the same time provide donors with uh, enough sort of part of, of this discussion and also monitoring and oversight to make sure that projects are implemented the way they are, they should be. So, you know, that, that whole discussion, I think, is quite crucial. Um, and, and this is something... A lot of people, it's often the first question, you know, can we send money to Ukraine? We know that it had problems with corruption in the past. What is going to change? We have also seen similar discussions in, in other reconstruction efforts. So we just think that, you know, setting that that some, some type of independent agency with close links to the EU, uh, but where the Ukrainian government is really putting forward a list of priorities that can then be discussed with with the international donor community together so we don't get you know bilateral discussions with 20 different donors asking for different things that would be sort of the most efficient way of of organizing support to ukraine we think uh, so that's sort of the key of this sure. and, and then of course thinking about how, how do we make it predictable? So we get the funds there and then you disperse funds at a certain time schedule and have a reasonable plan of, of you know, when can we do different kind of rebuilding efforts? Would the EBRD be the right vehicle in your view? No, I mean, what we argue in this report is actually to set up an independent EU agency focused only on the reconstruction of Ukraine but where we, it's a bit like the Marshall Fund after the Second World War. So really something uh, with with some amount of autonomy, but, you know, with a governance structure so that the Ukrainian side and the donor sides are all represented uh, in, in some type of supervisory board. But, you know, it would then gather the European Union, it could be the US, it could be all the other G7 countries that have been part of, of, of helping Ukraine and also, of course, Singapore and, and other countries around the world. Uh, and then you would add the, the usual multilaterals like the World Bank, the IMF, the EBRD, all of these guys. So, so that there is one place where all of these discussions can be coordinated. So it doesn't become too piecemeal and there's too much, you know, double work on, on both sides of the table, basically. So you don't think that we have in the global financial architecture right now a multilateral body that is neutral enough and autonomous enough to address uh, Ukraine's uh, post-reconstruction or post-conflict reconstruction needs that a new organization should be in place? Well, we think this is such a significant uh, undertaking. So, you know, just saying that a, a place like the European Investment Bank or EBRD or, or any other organization would be able to deal with this without sort of significant additions to their capacities. And also, I think, a dedicated governance structure because, you know, some of the multilaterals would obviously have countries in their membership that are not really supporting Ukraine at this stage. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we really need this to be sort of efficient, streamlined, and it should also have this focus on the long-term goal of Ukraine being EU accession. So that's why we think it should also be connected to, to the EU in, in some way or another. I see. Okay. Uh, and from your institute's perspective, what is your sort of day-to-day -day engagement with the Ukrainian authorities, 
or through your institution in Kiev? You know, what are your day to day work? Well, a lot of it is about, of course, supporting our colleagues at the Kiev School of Economics, and they are very much engaged with the Ukrainian government uh, and international community at large, talking about exactly the issues that we have been discussing here. So, how what are the costs of of destruction at this stage? How can we organize reconstruction looking forward? What are what what is sort of the macro financial support that is needed now? So a lot of this, and of course also they are still doing uh, online both offline and online teaching with their students that are are still at the school. So I would say that's that's the main uh, uh, main part of of our work in this. And then of course being out discussing this issue in different uh, media seminars etc. Just to make sure that policymakers and and people at large understand what is actually going on in Ukraine at this stage. Okay, um, we have spent most of this conversation talking about uh, Ukraine. I'd like to talk a little bit about Russia, but before I do that, I want to ask you one specific question on this um, uh, ongoing talk about the price cap on Russian oil. Um, how do you see being a effective tool? Are putting pressure on Russia and and what's your sort of you know own sense of the mechanism that is being put in place? Yeah, I think you know for the people not so familiar with Russia, we we should remind people that oil and gas revenues, the export revenues from that, is really the crucial factor both on the external side and to the government's budget in Russia. So I mean, I've I've done m- models in the past of of Russia growth rates, and you can basically explain 75% of Russia's growth with one variable, which is the changes in international oil prices. So that's a unique, very simple macro model, but it also tells you the importance of of oil and and other uh, exports like this. But so the price cap is very, very critical in terms of limiting the resources to the government's budget. Uh, and, And it's also going to affect the Russian economy more general. Um, and I would say that, you know, it, it's as always in the details. So what is the price cap going to be? Is it going to be $60, $70 per barrel or is it going to be $30 uh, per barrel? And that makes a huge difference in terms of, of the macroeconomic impact on Russia. Uh, and, and from my point of view, if it's 60, 70, it's not really going to be so painful for mm-hmm. Russia. So we really need to think about a much lower price if it's it's really going to make a difference. But of course, you know, all 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 these things are some steps in the right direction. But I just think we cannot again hesitate in terms of what types of of restriction we impose on the Russian economy. This this really needs to be a seriously binding price cap. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're spending way too much uh, energy on on implementing something that that may not be so critical. But but of course, you know, it's better to make a price cap at seventy. But I think you know, already today, Russia is getting less for the oil it's selling. So to me, it wouldn't really be a binding constraint. Mm. Um- Earlier this year, when the conflict broke out, we saw fairly strong resolve on the part of Europe and the U.S. in terms of putting on, you know, series of sanctions. And we had all these, you know, headline grabbing uh, news uh, items uh, about, you know, yachts of oligarchs being seized here. Or as you pointed out earlier, the central bank assets being frozen in the West. Um, Are you surprised by the lack of impact of those sanctions on Russia? Well, first of all, I think the most serious sanctions are the ones connected to, to oil and gas, and they haven't really been implemented. So, you know, once they are in effect, we can maybe discuss a bit mm-hmm. more. Uh, but I also think that most of these types of sanctions would take time. The only thing that where I think, you know, we could have caused a much more immediate effect is if we had had full scale sanctions on the financial sector. Now this was taken in steps, you know, kicking Russian banks out of SWIFT and prohibiting transactions, etc. Um, so if that had been done on, on the larger banks immediately, I think that 
could have triggered actually a financial crisis in Russia. But the way it was implemented step by step, I think we basically uh, let the Russian side have a lot of time to adjust to these sanctions. So that with, with a central bank that is used to dealing with crisis, which the Russian central bank is, <clears throat> it just means that they adopt, they put in measures to, to counter these uh, sanctions. And that makes the immediate impact uh, smaller than it would have been otherwise. Uh, but I think, you know, again, we should remember that this is this is just the start of this process for the Russian economy. So the longer term outlook is, is much more severe than just, you know, having four or five percent drop of GDP this year. Yeah, I want to actually touch on that issue. So the financial or economic growth cost in the short term may be absorbed given how large Russia is and it is sort of self-sufficient in food and energy and so on, and it has a few allies with which its trade continues. But it seems to me, uh, probably maybe we can shift a little bit about the discussion to technology access. Um, I mean, Russia is a country that has had a tradition of technology prowess, but at the same time, uh, some of the modern technologies, if you will, whether it is chips or um, the, the cloud uh, servers and so on, uh, it seems to me that those things getting frozen out, and particularly the support of Western tech companies, that could be fairly damaging for Russia in the long term. Uh, your thoughts? Yes, absolutely. And, and we know also more generally what is building uh, a modern economy. It's not digging up stuff from the ground, oil or gas, but it's really to make sure that people's inventions and ideas and and etc technologies as we talk about those are the sustainable forces of long-term growth and and that's definitely not going to be looking good for russia of course they can substitute some of the western technologies with things from china and other places but not all of it uh, but again it, it doesn't lead to an immediate collapse it's just that the the growth outlook uh, is also clouded by by this particular thing, and of course we also know that some of the the high tech military equipment really needs chips from from uh, the West, and and then it's a question of how much circumvention of sanctions do we get uh, from these types of restrictions. Right um, now, this is a question not regarding Russia or Ukraine, but rather generally in Europe. You're sitting in Sweden. Uh, whenever I travel to Europe, you know the last few months have been all about you know how tough this winter is going to be, uh, whether it is with respect to energy inflation or might be even you know some blackouts. Uh, what's your sense of Europe's preparedness to deal with this winter? Uh, I think we have come a long way from the initial you know total panic mode. We have seen that gas storages have actually been filled in Germany to basically 100%. Right. So a lot of discussions, of course, saying that everything would collapse tomorrow. It didn't really do that. Uh, of course, then it's about the weather. How cold is it getting? How much gas do we need to heat homes and et cetera? But, but I think, you know, there are a lot of things going on now that is making us less dependent on the Russian energy uh, imports. It does cost uh, the European economies in terms of, you know, financial support, et cetera. Uh, but I, I really think that compared to the suffering going on in Ukraine, what we experience in Europe is really just a matter of how, how much solidarity can we show each other in Europe and, and how can we just be organized and, and help each other out through this winter? I think that's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really something that we can manage, but it will require political leadership, basically. And, and if I may, just as a comparison, you know, Europe has spent over 600 billion euros or is going to spend over 600 billion euros to support consumers and companies in Europe for the higher energy prices okay so that's 600 billion we're talking about macroeconomic support to ukraine for the whole year of 2023 is 50 
So it's not even 10% of what we're spending in terms of subsidies on energy to consumers and households. So, you know, again, yeah, it's it's complicated here, but, you know, compared to, to Ukraine, we can both afford it and we can do something about it if we're just, uh, you know, cooperating in Europe, I think. Okay, I've saved the hardest question for the end, Torbjörn. What will 2023 bring for Ukraine and Russia? Well, of course, I hope an end to the war. Uh, that's in everyone's interest. Uh, if there was ever a win-win, ending the war is clearly a win-win. Uh, maybe it's not a win for Mr. Putin himself, but you know, to people in Russia, to people in Ukraine, to people in Europe and all over the world, that would be the obvious win-win solution to this. Will it actually happen? Well, it, it really comes down to how much sacrifices are Russian people willing to put up with to, to keep the fighting going on in Ukraine. It's obvious that Ukrainians are going to put up with this for as long as needed. So it's really up to Russia when they want to end this war. Uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that this insight will dawn on them sooner rather than later, basically. I think that's a, as good a note to end this podcast as anything. Uh, Torbjörn Becker, thank you so much for your time and insights. Thank you, Timer. I would like to also thank our listeners. Uh, Kopi Time was produced by Ken Delbridge from Spy Studios. Daisy Sharma and Violet Lee provided additional production assistance. Kopi Time is for information only and does not represent any trade recommendations. All 90 episodes of the podcast are available on YouTube and all major podcast platforms, including Apple, Google, and Spotify. As for our research publications, webinars, and live streams, you can find them all by Googling PBS Research Library. Have a great day.